Dram watering tools have been the professional's choice for quality and durability for over 75 years. Use a Dram rain wand to create the softest shower of rain for your beds and containers. A nine pattern revolver spray gun for a variety of uses. Or a color storm sprinkler for a lush green lawn and garden. Dram, the professional's choice for lawn and garden. Available at a fine garden center near you. Visit us online at dramm.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. Just not always the same ones. I'm Steve Aiken, the editor of Fine Gardening Magazine. And I'm Danielle Sherry. I'm the senior editor here at Fine Gardening Magazine. And I feel like right at the start, we should say, you are the boss. You are above <laughs> me in the pecking order. It's a great way to start. People it, get yeah. people get very confused about this. But yeah, Steve is what should be named the editor-in-chief because he is the editor-in-chief. But we, we like to keep things simple around here and just say editor. As long as you know who's boss, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what I'm going to boss you about today? What? I'm going to boss you about seeds. Oh, Yeah, hey. things that we start from seed. Do you do a lot of seed starting? Uh, I, I sort of uh, vary. I, I, uh, I'm cyclical. Like I will go and I will start like a gazillion things from seed one year, mm -hmm. uh, and then it won't turn out very good, and so I'll start fewer and get down to where I don't do any. And then I'll realize I should start something from seed next year, and then I'll start, and it'll build up, and then the next thing you know, I'll have trays everywhere. And yeah. Do you think it's directly related to how long our winter has been? Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Because I'm not feeling it all that much this year, and I think that's well, because Don't say we, that going into the episode. Well, I know. I mean. I'm still I'm still starting some things from seed. I am, of course. For, primarily for me, it's usually vegetables. Um, but we've had a really, really warm winter, per se. We haven't really had a winter. And I, I feel like when I was thinking about this, the worse the winter, the more seeds I start and I get on the chain. I, I think it just like makes me feel better to have something green and some gardening going on when there's three feet of snow. Well, I like I like seed starting because it gives me a chance to grow things I probably wouldn't normally grow or um, wouldn't see in a nursery. Okay. Like, I, you know, if you're perusing the seed packets and I see something I've never heard of, I'm like, fair. Let me try that. You so know. do you do, you primarily do perennials and some annuals, right? Uh, well, this year, yeah. I've okay. done I've done edibles in the past. Oh, um, yeah, I remember the great tomato seedling debacle well, of 2016, well, right? Was, was it a debacle? It, well, I have a picture of you holding up probably a thousand tomato sprouted seedlings in your hands trying to figure out how to <laughs> separate them. <laughs> yeah, they, they got uh, intertwined. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. There might have been some overzealous sowing. But that, that was, that was, but that was the year that we were um, testing tomato gadgets. Oh. There was a year prior to that. I'd st I planted a good... 15, 16, 18 tomato plants and didn't get any tomatoes. Oh, at your house or in the test garden? At my house. Oh, bummer. The squirrels and chipmunks and other critters ate quite well off of my, but I never got any. Oh, so the plants did well. You just didn't get any fruit. So, yeah. all right. So you do primarily this year, you're going to do perennials and annuals. So what are you going to do? Uh, well, you know, one thing I've been dying to try for years, I've bought seed packets and just let the seed kind of go, you know, bad without ever planting them but this year is going to be the year that i finally grow california poppies oh. uh, wonderful little plant uh native uh, to california obviously that's what i call them, california poppies <laughs> um and they usually have these um orange or yellowish um sort of they, they remind me of prairie wine cups yeah they're like a cup shape um like a tulip flower uh, almost that kind of it's a very low growing kind of grows along the ground um, ferny foliage. Um, I, I always thought they were they were great, but I'm not a big fan of orange, so I've kind of held off. Uh, but the cultivar I'm growing this year is Alba, which is a white flower oh, version of it. Okay. Um, so it likes it uh, sunny and dry, and I have the perfect spot for that. Um, you know, down in in front, you know, uh, near the roadside. Okay. So. Um, it, some species of uh, of Escholtzia is the is the um, the Latin name uh, are perennial 
and technically this one could survive the winter if it were dry, but uh, like I don't legitimately think survive on its own roots or so, so supposedly, oh, but okay. I think it it would survive a western winter, not a okay. eastern winter. So um, I, I saw some things that they were they were hardy to zone four, but you know. That's probably like, you know, Idaho or Montana. Yeah, or, not you know, really well drained soil. Saskatoon, you know, zone four or something <laughs> like that, but not a Connecticut zone four. Not because of the temperature, but because of the winter moisture. Yeah. So, um, but I'm really looking forward to that because they're supposedly super easy to grow, almost to the point where they become weedy okay. in certain areas. Um, I can take a little weediness. Uh, so does it plant. need to be stratified at all? Do you have to scarify the seed? Nope. Any special nope. conditions for nope. this guy? Nope. Nice. Mm-hmm. See, that's what gets me with several of the perennials that I've actually thought about. Okay, maybe I might grow this is that you have to do these special conditions. You know, you got to remember to stick it in the refrigerator for a period of time. You got to take a little emery board and nick the seeds or soak them beforehand. Yeah, soaking beforehand isn't a big deal. The, the cold stratification I find a little weird because... I'm not sure if I should just put the the seed packet in the fridge or if I have to mix it with some moist vermiculite. Right. You know, and then it's 30, uh, you know, anyway. It's and then couldn't you just go out and sprinkle the seeds outside before the winter comes? Yeah, you, you really could. <laughs> yeah. But I never remembered to do that. No, because, you, you know, you buy your, your seeds in January, February. It's yeah. too late for that. Exactly, exactly. Well, so I'm going to move into the edible realm because the thing that I, no matter what, always seem to grow in my little grow late system is tomatoes. And it's just simply because you just can't find, you know, you can find big boy, big girl. Some nurseries now are doing some of the heirloom tomatoes. But I really don't get like those super, super cool, weird tomatoes that I like to grow in addition to, you know, my sauce tomatoes and such. And the first one that comes to mind um, that I've been reading about and um, actually had a few friends see at a trade show was Mountain Rouge. And I've grown the Mountain series of tomatoes before. My go-to sauce tomato is Mountain Fresh, which is a determinant tomato. And it's just, you know, an all-around good saucing tomato about the size of, you know, a small baseball. Well, this one is an indeterminate plant. And it sounds to me like a brandy wine. Um, it sounds to me like a pink fleshed, you know, slightly larger than a baseball, maybe more softball sized tomato. Um, that's going to be super sweet. It's going to taste much like a brandy wine, but it's got all the disease resistance that a hybrid mountain fresh tomato has. So it resists um, the late blight. It does um, resist ver- verticillium wilt. Um, it's nematode apparently resistant, which isn't really an issue for us here in the east. But how does it how does it handle the voles? Um, well, my garden, my vegetable garden, handles it just fine because remember I dug out my my beds oh, last right. year and I laid the hardware cloth underneath it. So, so far so good with that. But um, yeah, this was an AAS winner too. So, you know, it's really got some awards and accolades under its belt. And um, I'm, I'm willing to try anything right now that is a tomato that says that it is a bomb proof, disease proof um, tomato because I've had some serious, serious issues. Usually when they're that disease proof, they taste like Garbage, um, right? right? Yeah. Exactly. So I'm going to give it a whirl because apparently this is tastes like a brandy wine, but has the disease, disease resistance of a uh, far tougher tomato. T- tomatoes are so easy to start from seed no, because so they, they, they grow, uh, they germinate readily and are easy to take care of under lights, but also because the seed is easy to see and deal oh, with. Oh, yeah, exactly. You don't need like one of the special little cedars or, you know, a, a magnifying, magnifying glass. glass. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, and um, I guess I should probably mention 73 days to maturity on that tomato. So that's relatively short. Is it? In tomato years. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of those beef steaks can go up to like 80, 90 days. So 73 days, that's not too bad. It's less cool. than three months. Cool. I'll, I'll look forward to a, a few of those for my summer sandwiches. <laughs> you never bring in your tomatoes. Are you really saying that to I me? I am. I brought in a boatload last year. Did not you? Not only that. But who brought you in her special tomato you, you sauce? You brought me sauce. It was good. All right. Um, okay. I don't remember the tomatoes. So you It could know, have happened. Yeah. It definitely. I should backtrack. I should backtrack quickly. Backtrack. Backtrack. Perhaps there's some editing that could be done on this. <laughs> it won't happen. All right. What else are you growing? Are you growing any edibles? No. Well, no, but I think I might have been hungry when I was ordering seeds because for some reason I ordered something called chocolate daisy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> what is that? Uh, Berlandiera Lerata. 
I've never heard of this. Chocolate daisy. It's a perennial native to Texas. Um, okay. It has sort of like these yellow uh, star-shaped flowers. Okay, um, I'm picturing like a galardia. Like. No, I'm thinking like a black-eyed Susan, but with fewer petals. Oh, And okay. shorter. And um, so I, I wrote down the description. It's a mounded, coarse, gray-green foliage, has a chocolate aroma. Oh, okay. Uh, a, a leafy plant often with many short branches at the base and longer leaning branches ending in leafless stalks top, topped by flower heads with yellow rays surrounding a maroon central disc. Oh. That sounds pretty good. And it stuff like chocolate. It kind of does. Cool. It almost sounds like a what are those crosses? The gazania daisies. Have you ever, do you remember yes. seeing that? It, that yes. it sounds like that, like a gazania. But less attractive. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so really you're just in it for the chocolate. Maybe they okay. they open they open up uh, like like late at night or early morning and then okay. as the day goes they kind of close up again. I like that. But they smell like chocolate All right. and they don't need a lot. And uh, again, like it's it's how it's how you learn about plants as you grow them. So I, by the end of this year, I should know something about Berlandiera lorata. I'm excited. The chocolate daisy. Well, because I really I actually and, and it, it's it's a perennial zones four to ten. Okay, there you so go. So in is... theory, it should live over. Which would be nice because chocolate cosmos, which is something that I've grown in the past that I love just because it smells like chocolate, isn't hardy for us. So, all right. You, you. Well, are cosmos an annual or are they just not hardy? Apparently, they zone eight, zone nine, chocolate cosmos because really? it's not technically a, it's not cosmos, what is it, benefiatus? It's a cosmos. Bipinatus is the uh, something the else. One. No, it's a different one. Yeah, it's, it's a different else. species. So, yeah, yeah cool. apparently. Um, but it, this sounds like more of a winter for, especially a colder, colder location. Maybe, but I mean, you know, native to Texas and Colorado, and uh, you know, again, you're gonna it, it, it might be a western well drained zone soil. four. Yeah, yeah. So we'll Are you see. gonna put it down by the road? I don't know yet. Because you've got well drained soil down there, that might be. A good yeah, spot but it, for it. it gets to be one to two feet high, and that could be a little uh, too high for where I need it. Um, so I don't know where without killing or what yourself I'm going to do with it. And so yeah. while backing out of the driveway and nothing yeah. you'll see. <laughs> well, so I talked about this um, in our new plant section, actually, of the magazine that came out not too long ago. Is this the pumpkin? This is the pumpkin. Okay. I'm obsessed with this pumpkin. Okay, so this pumpkin. We pump- all should be. You all should be because it's called Black Cat, and it is literally a black pumpkin. It's sugar pumpkin sized. It's only about, you know, a pound size pumpkin. It's not that big. It's got orange flesh on the inside, but the outer skin is truly black. Now, eventually, as it ages out on the vine, and if you leave it on the vine too long, it turns to kind of like a dark green instead. It looks more like an acorn squash. But if you harvest it early, Early enough, you get this black skinned pumpkin, carve it into a jack o' lantern, and it's glowing orange from the inside. And you know how much I love Halloween. So, this is a lot. This is a lo- uh, yes, I know, but explain for the people who are listening. I mean, who don't I, know you. I have a huge Halloween party every year, and I love Halloween, it's my favorite holiday. Have you have you guys done Simon and Garfunkel yet? As a as a no, we haven't. Oh, We're so, talking about my husband. Yeah. My husband and I have had epic costumes. So do that. do the cover of Simon and Garfunkel's Greatest Hits. Look and you'll look at that. And okay, then, and then you'll see. Okay, you we might have to. We were yeah. thinking about ZZ Top actually this year. I know. I'm, I'm not feeling that one. All so, right, um, all right. You really, but you really did like when we did Hall and Oates. I did like Hall and Oates. That was that yeah. was a good one. <laughs> and have, have you have you done uh, Stevie Nicks and Mick Fleetwood from the cover of the, the Fleetwood Mac oh, album? Oh no, that well, from Rumors. That would be good. No, the one before that, where like uh, he's like has his knee up and like she's sort of like leaning over, kind of thing. Is that the one where he looks like a minstrel? The, kind the of? one, the one with Rhiannon on it. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. I'm gonna have to look okay. back through and I'll anyway, figure it out. Okay. Back, oh, back oh, 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 oh. Are we doing a plant podcast? Yeah. Oops, sorry. So, anywho, this is Black Cat. This is an awesome one. Um, it's not generally something that I start inside, but I'm going to this year because I really want to get a jump start. So, you know, things in the pumpkin family, um, the squashes family. A lot of times, I will start them indoors. You know, a couple of weeks before they can be set outside, just to get a jump on the season because we. We can have some really cool springs. Um, it's a semi-bush variety, so that means you know vines going out four to five feet in every direction. You can trellis it up, but you're going to have to kind of create the hammocks for those pumpkins because a, a pound-sized pumpkin could could pull the pull the vine down a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I was going to mention trellising. 
because yeah. you're using a smaller fruit. It's okay to... You, you definitely can. You definitely can. And, you know, much like, you know, the smaller watermelons, the icebox watermelons, when you trellis them up, you just got to sometimes give them those little support hammocks, you know, out of like a piece of t-shirt or whatever so it doesn't weight the vine down. But um, you the, apparently you get five to eight pumpkins per vine. So that's a pretty good yield. If I get one, I'm going to be so excited. Um, yeah, and 77 days days to maturity not a lot lot at all yeah but i still want to get a jump on it because i want to make sure that you know i've got these for halloween i've got them i should probably oh wait are we mentioning where we're where we can where listeners can get these seeds we can mention all right go ahead mention your guys Uh, well so uh, everything i have is from so far is from select seed okay selectseed.com yep um, That's yeah. awesome. All right, so you can get uh, the Mountain Rouge tomato is being sold by Totally Tomatoes, which is a great weird tomato plant type resource. And uh, Black Cats, you can get Black Cat Pumpkin from New England Seed, and that's neseed.com. So you can find those online. Cool. Um, the one plant that I'm going to talk about that is not from Select Seed um, is uh, Long Sepal Penstemon. Penstemon calicosis. You have a thing about penstemons. Well, I was I always thought of them as a Western plant, and then I just discovered these Eastern natives. I'm like, oh, isn't that cool? Um, so I, I've grown some some of this plant, and we had it at the, the plant sale. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I started growing it in the garden. And they're, they're, it looks just like the other penstemons, uh, the other taller penstemons, you know, Huskers red or Husker red and Pocahontas and all that, but just without the dark foliage. It has like a green okay. foliage. But it has those long, um, almost like a foxglove that sends up the long stalk with, with the little tubular flowers on it. Um, and they're, they're pinkish flowers, and they're great. You know, okay. they're early to midsummer. Um, they pop out, and there's always like bees or something, you know, crawling up in there. Um, and I just, I love the fact that it's, um, it's, it's our hometown, it's our hometown penstemon. Yeah. So, it's the um, Eastern girl. yeah. So, so we were growing this, and then we're also doing a project in the test garden this year where we're growing some penstemon. Um, we're growing penstemon digitalis, a straight species, and we're growing some cultivars of it to see, you know, how the pollinators react. To yeah. do they prefer the straight species or do they prefer the cultivars? And um, I said, oh, we should grow some penstemon calicosis because that's native to around here to see how that So does one would it. think, in theory, that the pollinators would love our East Coast native penstemon. I, I, but if, if not equally, yeah. you know, uh, perhaps more. Um, and so I, I don't think I could find a source of it um as a plant? A full plant. Okay. But I, I like the idea of growing things from seed because that you kind of get to know a plant better if you grow it from seed and you're a little more attached to it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's your baby. You raised it, you know. Um, and plus, if they're native around here, then growing the seed should be easy because this is their native Yeah, I was habitat. just going to ask that. Easier, you know. Yeah. Um, but no special requirements on this. No stratification or anything like that okay. uh, as far as I know. Um, but just a, a, a great plant and if i can get a ton of it by growing it from seed that's cool have you grown penstemons from seed before any kind any species okay all right i'm just curious because you know some things take a while they take a couple of years really if you grow them from seed perennial to really beef up and look like anything so it'll be interesting to see where penstemon falls in that in that range yeah i mean i don't expect anything out of it the first year yeah you know and then uh you know hopefully the second year it looks like something yeah the third year it might even bloom (gasps) Sleep, creep, yeah. leap. Yeah. You know, there you go. Um, all right. Okay. And did um, I mention where that was available from? No, uh, I don't think uh, you did. Uh, Prairie Moon Nursery. Oh, from. okay. They sell, they sell seeds of, of all, not all, but like a ton of native species. Prairie it's, Moon? It, yeah. And well, it's, it's it, a native plant right. nursery. Right. Well, that's what yeah, they, they specialize in. But it can be hard in. to find the straight species. True. A lot of these things that a lot of more people are looking for because of their you know, the pollinator preference mm-hmm. for them, um, and that's a great place to go. They just they have seeds. They they sell. Uh, they do plant material they do plants too, too, and yeah, mail so. order. They ship yeah. mail order. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. I've never ordered from them before, but yeah, they've they've come up in our sourcing quite a bit in the magazine. All right, I'm going to give you this is this is uh, buyer's choice here. Should I give you another um, edible? Or should I give you the one ornamental that I have on my list? Um, you don't care either way, do you? <laughs> well, no, I, I know what your ornamental is, and you know, 
I'm not that interested. So. <laughs> How are you not that interested? All right, just out of spite, I'm going to mention this. Okay, so one of the one of the few annuals that I grow is Cleome. And not, not, a, not, a, not a fan. I don't have anything against it, but I'm just not like I'm of all the annuals you could grow. Why would you grow that one? Because it is awesome. First of all, it's deer proof because it's got spikes up and down those large, you know, kind of I don't know. They're, the, they're the flowers look like a TV antenna from the 50s. No, like all these weird they look like exploding fireworks, and they come into bloom right around the Fourth of July, which is amazing. And the blooms. No, no one has mistaken those for fireworks. Ever. Oh my gosh. That yeah. is that is literally that is almost what every visitor who's not a gardener who comes to my garden says. Oh look, that's a firework plant. It's actually called spider flower. Is actually what clean yeah. is called. Yeah, nothing which is nothing like fireworks. It plant. looks just like fireworks. It really does. And the the variety. It, it looks like an old TV antenna. No. <laughs> Oh, it doesn't. They're beautiful. They're tall plants, three to five feet tall. And here's here's my thing. I w- normally would not bother growing an annual unless it's hard to find. Now, this one I'm going to start growing because you know what? Annuals have become kind of expensive, particularly the Cleomis the last few years. A pack of annuals. Remember when a pack of annuals, you'd get six plants and it would be like, what, a dollar ninety nine, something like that? Yeah. Last year, five bucks. Four ninety nine for well, four for four plants. So this it's finally gotten to the point where I use these so much in the garden as hole fillers. I need I need a more economical way to get them. So I'm going to grow them from seed. Have, have you grown them from seed before? I have I have, but way back in the beginning because usually they will self sow in the garden for a few years and then it's like they slowly dwindle out. And I think that's because I slowly weed them out accidentally without meaning to. Also, are these things going to come true from seed? Exactly. Sometimes no, but I don't really care because, you know, I get a blend. The one that I'm going to do this year is Fountain Blend, and it's from Botanical Interests. And it's a combination of kind of a, a light, pale, pale, pale pink, which is almost a white pink, a white, and then a purple flowering version of it. And they're just, they're beautiful. And they're so long bloomed. So it's, it's going to look like a city skyscape with all the all the antennas sticking up <laughs> off the roofs with all these. Well, you know, you got to remember too that, you know, I do primarily trees and shrubs in my borders. So I need, I need an annual that's beefy. I can't be putting like some small little, whatever it was burbania so you're, you're, or what you're, you're saying that they're boring you're you're no your beds are boring they're because they're beefy. Trees and shrubs. they branch out they almost become like mini shrubs by the end of the season they branch out considerably and they'll start blooming in early summer they go all the way through they usually last the first couple of frosts and like i said they do reseed readily so hopefully you, are you going to direct so I'm not going to. I'm going to start these guys inside because you know what? I want them to be beefy early. And again, that's that's just my thing. I like to start it inside and then move them out so I kind of get a jump on the season. Because it can take a while for the soil around here to warm up. You know, our temperatures, our air temperatures warm up relatively quickly, but soil temperatures kind of take a while. Oh, maybe not this year. Uh, I know, six, right? 65 next 65 week? degrees, in, I know. In March. So right. again, that was botanical interest which carries that and I like Cleome Fountain Blend. Uh, another plant I haven't heard of that I'm going to try growing. Okay. Um, and I probably haven't uh, heard of it because its name changed. Uh, the name I sent you is incorrect. Oh, great. All so, right. But this is this is Joan Lorraine Asserina. It's a vine. Okay. The cultivar name is Joan Lorraine. It's like they couldn't decide which name or, to give it. It's like two yeah, first names. Yeah, that's two first jo- names. Lorraine, it sounds like Asserina. a librarian. Uh, Asserina Scandins, uh, zones 9 to 10. Okay. Um, but its name got changed to uh, Morandia. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It I kind of like sounds that. Sounds like it had a, um, you know, identity crisis and like, oh, no, I'm no longer Joan. I'm Morandia. I you just know, love it. So. It sounds like an exotic location to go yeah, vacation. It? Yeah, it's like it's like the island where Leonardo DiCaprio shot the film or something like yes. that. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's a climbing vine to about ten feet. Uh, they're also known as climbing snapdragon, so that should give you a sense of what the flowers look like. They're cool. tubular, uh, with that you know, outward flaring uh, petals, um, and they are just a wonderful royal purple with a white throat okay. um, to them. So supposedly super easy to grow. Um, Sun shade, uh, f- uh, a full sun to partial shade. I've okay. heard some things that they 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 morning sun, okay. Um, but they like a little shade, which is cool uh, by me. But ten feet tall, which is a good 
height for for a vine. I've got That's some huge. privacy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you going to direct sow that, or are you going to start that inside? I think I am going to do what the package says, <laughs> which does not. It doesn't give as he consults the seed packet in front of him. I like when a seed packet tells you which one is the best one to do. Yes. Like this is recommended, or you know, indoor sowing is not recommended. Um, or either is fine, but they, yeah. they, 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 they don't give me anything. All right. Uh, but it says if I'm doing it indoors, it would be 10 to 12 weeks before planting outside. So I should probably wow. do, do it now. Yeah, you should. Um, keep it 65 uh, to 70 degrees. It's going to get what it's going to get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then set outside after last frost. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you better start that. That seems like that's a pretty long stretch there. You better start those like immediately. You actually should probably right. leave the podcast right now. Okay. <laughs> You got it. <laughs> no, that looks really cool. I've never, never even heard of that vine right? before. Right, so, so now I will know about Asarina or Mirandia. Right. Whoever she likes to be called. Uh, <laughs> um, I, have no, I have another one that's just all white, uh, but I don't know why. The purple one's prettier. I no, don't know why the purple I got one's two. prettier. It's a, like a plant, a white plant. I know, that's why I almost like turned my nose down at your at your California poppy that is white. But What's wrong with white? I don't know. I'm not a, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's because we've been taking photographs of gardens for so long and white is the hardest color in the garden sometimes to photograph because it blows out if you have any amount of sunlight on it. But yeah. a, lot of, a lot of Cleomies are white. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> 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 All right. So my last one is another edible, but this is the best cucumber. If you're going to grow a cucumber, I will not if i can't get a hold of these seeds then i don't grow cucumbers that year and this is suyo long you can get it from johnny select seeds it is think of it as the english cucumbers that you can get in the grocery store but it kind of does a little curl at the end so these are long cucumbers they can be up to 15 to 18 inches long that's a ginormous cucumber um i have never seen a cucumber variety produce as many cucumbers as this. I plant one plant. I get dozens of jars of pickles. We eat cucumber salad. Hey, you make pickles out of these things? All year long. Yeah. I just, you know, even though it's 15 inches long, you know, you can dice that up three times, make it into spears. You got two jars of pickles out of one cucumber. Hmm. It's incredible. And it's one of the bitter free cucumbers. So it's, you know, a, a less polite way of saying it's a burpless variety. So if you're somebody who's got a little indigestion issues, this one is a good one for you. Yeah, I'm looking at you, yeah, Steve. Well, with, I've traveled sure. with you before. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the other thing that's cool about this Suyo Long is that um, it's one of the most powdery mildew resistant cucumbers that I've grown. We have a tendency to get some hot and humid weather here in the Northeast, and I always get powdery mildew on my cucumber plants, especially as they start to flag towards the end of the summer. And this guy doesn't stay mildew-free, but definitely a lot less mildew incidence on this particular variety. Um, yeah, I just love it. I am, again, going to start it inside so I can get a jump on it, um, but the, the germination rate is only a few days, so really, I'll just start these maybe two weeks before I've got a put them outside um, and 60 days to maturity. So start getting cucumbers in less than two months. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I've grown those. They're, yeah. they're cool. They're uh, super cool. They're so, so awesome. They look interesting. Instead of getting, uh, instead of getting fat, they get long. Yeah. They get so, long and they yeah. kind of curl and twist yeah, a little bit around. at the end. Yeah. 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 Very they're cool. very ornamental and I just love them. Very, I'm very th cool. I'm, I'm trying to think of why I have not bought seeds for of those but you, you can't possibly start all of the seeds that are in your packet oh no 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 i, so don't. I don't need to buy seeds is what i'm saying oh you yeah no that's a right a few, few extra seeds oh you think so huh because everything sounds better with a british accent here's peter with some thoughts on saving money what if i told you i would sell you 15 20 or more plants for less than five dollars that is less than five dollars for all the plants you might think I just dug up a bed of some common ground cover like Pachysandra and I'm trying to make a quick buck. All the plants I'm selling are unbelievably common. No, I'm talking about the value in a packet of seeds. They contain dozens of potential plants and really cost more than a fancy cup of coffee. Doesn't the thought of inexpensive plants make your pulse race? The lazy among you, hello Steve, are saying, but you have to do all that work just to get them to a decent size. If watering a little pot of soil and providing some light are really too much for you, then maybe gardening really isn't for you. 
Seeds want to grow. You just have to give them the right conditions. Warmth, moisture and light, that's all they ask. Some need more. Place them in the refrigerator for 30 days, then take them out and plant them. That still isn't what qualifies as difficult. This cold stratification process has many variations. Some seeds require 60 days or more. Some require more than one stretch in the fridge. The only really hard part, of course, would come if you have a teenage boy in your house. As we all know, they will eat anything. And the potential for your cold stratified columbine seeds ending up sprinkled on top of ice cream or nachos is quite high. If I have piqued your interest, then skip this morning's caramel macchiato and invest in a packet of seeds. Trust me, you'll be glad you did. Peter mentioned a caramel macchiato. How did he know that that's my favorite Starbucks drink? I don't know, but I like the way he kind of like almost turned it into an insult. I, well, of course you did. Of course you like that he turned it into an insult. You know who's not insulted or might be is actually Carol Collins, who is our fellow editor here on staff. And it was my bad. I forgot to invite her to come and speak on this podcast. So how about we get her expert testimony on what she's growing it from seed? She knows more than both of us put together. My name is Carol Collins. I am the associate editor at Fine Gardening, and I start a lot of seeds. So Danielle and Steve asked me to be their expert testimony for this episode. The first seeds that I'd like to talk about were passed down to me by my Aunt Bernadette. They are cranberry beans, and she got her original seeds from an older man from Bethlehem, New Hampshire, when she and Uncle Dennis were going to buy a table saw from him. The man said that his grandfather had grown them too, and so this line goes way back. They are just beautiful. Um, dark red skin with modeling, and um, I found out that it is a pole bean, so I will need to grow them on a structure. Um, I love the idea of heirloom seeds and the great varieties that we have to choose from today are because of all the ancestors that saved seeds and really like growing from seed. This is what it's all about. Another heirloom that I love is a tomato called striped German, and it is a great tasting yellow variety with red flame markings both inside and out. And I've been growing that one for years, but this year I also plan to try a new hybrid variety that was a 2020 All-American Selections regional winner both in the Northeast and in the Southeast. In the AAS trials, Buffalo Sun, which is all one word, was grown side by side with two similar varieties, Margold, which is another F1 hybrid, and my beloved Striped German. The trial judges observed that Buffalo Sun has the same great flavor and beautiful marble color of the comparison varieties, but it has better texture, higher yield, and less cracking. And best of all, it has late blight resistance. After the blighty season we had last year, that sounds great to me. I've been, for now three years or so, saving seeds from straw flower, which is Bracteantha, Bracteata, an Australian native. And I started with Johnny Selected Seeds Sultane Mix, uh, which has a nice range of colors. And I save the seeds in the fall. I direct sow them. It comes beautifully from seed. And I, you know, we all remember this, the straw flowers from the 80s when, you know, people use them for crafts. I love to see these standing in the garden. Uh, the, the pollinators go crazy for it. And, uh, and if you want to dry them, you do need to harvest them a little bit before they open and the pollinators never get a chance. So I would say grow a lot and then you can have enough for you and the pollinators. For peppers, I grow a lot of peppers, and uh, generally sweet peppers, not hot peppers. My my favorite is Carmen, which is a Corno de Toro type. Here in the Northeast, some other varieties don't tend to color up before our season ends, but I have never had a problem. I usually get nice red Corno de Toros from Carmen by August or so. This year, just for fun, I will also try growing a variegated bell pepper candy cane. It is said to have variegated foliage, and the fruit is also striped. So I can't wait to see how this one does. Pumpkins are something that I have not grown very much in the past because of the amount of space that they take up. But this year I have a new area that I'm taking over for vegetable production, and I plan to grow Bob's Designer Mixture of Pumpkins. 
These come from John Sheepers Kitchen Garden Seeds, and they source this exciting blend from Bob Kenders at Michigan's Backyard Bouquet Farm. Bob has come up with this wonderful mix that has green and orange and all different kinds of sizes and shapes, and you never quite know what you're going to get. But uh, to me, that sounds exciting, and I can't wait to put together a Halloween display with an unexpected mix of pumpkins. But to add a little bit of predictability, I'm also going to add a um, very old variety, which is Rouge Vif des Tombes. Uh, I think it is an old French variety. And that will give me these gorgeous flame red pumpkins that are big. And so no matter what the Bob's designer mix turns out, I know I'll also get some of these. I am also going to grow, aside from all the edibles, I am going to grow flowers from seed this year. And the one that I'm most excited about, well, there are actually a few, but one that I'm very excited about is the Queen Lime Zinnia Mixture. These sort of started hitting the market three, four years ago. Maybe they've been around longer, but I first became aware of them three or four years ago. And it's a, a line of zinnias that have green in their flowers. And while that may sound like, I don't know what that's going to look like, the, the pictures are amazing. So they have queen lime red. They have queen lime orange. And then the mixture has sort of uh, a mixture of the different colors that mixed with the green. So um, it seems like something that is maybe both old fashioned and also very modern. And I can't wait to try these in bouquets. There are some annual sages. Well, they are perennial in zones eight to 10, but for the rest of us, they are annual. Salvia farinacea, mealy cup sage. And it's a horrible, horrible common name. It sounds like off-brand ramen noodles, but it is a very cool plant. They are a low mounding variety, gets about 18 inches tall and wide. And I will grow white Victoria and Victoria blue so that I have some variety. And I will use these as sort of bedding plants. I have 72 started, and I probably will have some extras to give away with, to my coworkers. Another flower that I have always wanted to grow, but I haven't, and I don't know why, is borage. People say it grows very well from seed, and so I am going to put it down in between other things, and hopefully early in the season I'll start to see these baby plants come up and... Uh, and after that, I think I will have it forever because it readily self sows So it has been an early spring this year in New England, and I'm counting on it actually being spring and not going back to winter on us like it sometimes does. It really feels like things are getting going now. So I have taken a little gamble, and I have already planted my snap peas. I have Opal Creek, which is a yellow potted snap pea. I'm very excited to try that one. And then my standard sugar snap pea from Johnny Selected Seeds, which is super sugar snap. Um, these are planted pretty, pretty close spacing. So I put them in 25 per seeds per foot. I put the trellis in while I was planting the seeds. Usually I wait too long and then I'm sorry, this year I did it. I put my trellis in at the same time I'm planting seeds. So when they come up, they have something to climb on. And I probably won't get peas until maybe late May, early June at the earliest, but I feel like it is worth giving it a try. If, if it makes it a week or two, two earlier than usual, that's great. The other thing that I've already put in the ground, direct sown, is space spinach. That's a, a hybrid variety, and it's a good general purpose spinach, which I think you could sow anytime throughout the season. They recommend planting early, as soon as the ground can be worked, and we that's where we are right now, at least in my garden. Um, and then planting every two or three weeks so that you have consistent harvest throughout the season. So I usually am very good about getting that first crop in, but um, this year I'm going to be more disciplined about succession planting so that we can keep the spinach coming for longer. 
I hope that some of my seed starting choices inspire you to start some seeds of your own. Uh, Seed starting is fun. It's not that hard. The seeds do most of the work and they are incredibly tough, resilient little things. So even if you just plant a few, I would say get out there and start some seeds this season. Yeah, the best thing about uh, Carol's seed starting sort of uh, obsession is... That we get all of her cast-offs? Yes, she starts way too many. And they need a good home. <laughs> <laughs>